So we have been discussing the different steps through which the Lord in his divine song, that is the Bhagavad Gita, is trying to lift us up from the gloom in which we find ourselves encircled. So how to get out of this gloom, but how to get out of this despair? So the first call was to wake up, and after one is awake, he is asked to be a little forbearing, trying to hold patience, because all these things come and go. And after that, where he stopped last time, the first thing to hold on to is given in the form of the buddhi. Buddha sharanam anmicca. This is the first thing, the first refuge, the first anchorage in this upward journey. And the entire teaching of the Bhagavad Gita, we can say, is based on this buddhi yoga. This term buddhi yoga comes again and again. I have been insisting and requesting you that if you go only to the verses and try to find out in how many places this word buddhi yoga comes. We don't care to look into that. Where does the Lord use the word buddhi yoga? on how many occasions, and in what context, then many things may come out of that. If you really care to search where this term has been used. But here we are dealing with that command, Buddha Saranam Anvicca. Seek your refuge in the Buddhi. And here, Sri Krishna Prem in his commentary has come to our aid and he has given a very luminous commentary about this. I don't know if the pages will tally, those who have got this book already with them, that's the new edition. But in the second chapter, Yoga of the Discriminative Wisdom, as he calls it, that is Sangha Yoga. In page 14 of the first edition, he takes up this point and says, at this point it is necessary to say a few words about the nature of buddhi. You must try to understand what does the Lord mean by buddhi. Buddha sharana Now what is this buddhi? This is a very important thing. And therefore Sri Krishna Prem takes up this matter. And first of all, he says that we generally know the function of buddhi is nishchayatmika. It has been defined in our ancient philosophical text. Buddhi is distinguished from manas. The nature of manas is sankalpa vikalpatmakanga manaha. Sankalpa and vikalpa. By sankalpa and vikalpa is meant we are wavering. Sometimes we are thinking of this, sometimes we are thinking of something else. So, as we say in English, we are in two minds, as it were, tossing between two alternatives. This is the nature of our mind, our manas. And buddhi is called nishchayatimika. When we come to a fixed idea about a thing, Sri Krishna Prem points out that true it is that the buddhi is the faculty that gives determined knowledge, nishchayatimika buddhi. But he immediately points out, this is very important, the knowledge that it gives is no mere collection of intellectual propositions, but a living knowledge. 
This is a very important thing to note. Buddhi gives a living knowledge. And we, in the modern times, we are most accustomed to another term. He refers to that, better styled intuition. In the depth of the intellect, there is a faculty, which we generally call the intuition. But here, the Lord uses the word buddhi in the sense of intuition which gives us a living knowledge. And Sri Krishna Prem rightly gives a parallel. We have already covered that here. As we are doing the Mangala Charan, we always remember that Sarabho Upanishado Gabo. The Gita is the quintessence of the Upanishads. And Sri Krishna Prem here points out that in the Katho Upanishad, the Buddha is termed the Jnana Atman. Jnana Atma. I hope if you remember that verse, that gives the ladder of being, how to lift our consciousness. Jatsheda Bhanga Manasi Pragya. Tad Jatsheda Jnana Atmani. Jnanam Nijatshena Mahati. This is the step. Bhak here stands for the outer senses. The outer senses will be indrawn to the mind, manasi. And the manas should be resolved into jnanatma. So that brought us to this verse of the Katha Upanishad. This jnanatma is the buddhi atma. This is buddha sarana manicha. So from the level of the mind, one must rise to the level of this intuition or living knowledge. And therefore, Katha Upanishad calls it the Jnana Atman. So by the term Jnana Atman, Krishna Prem points out, it is at once the knowledge of the Atman and the faculty by which that knowledge is attained. The faculty by which that knowledge is attained. Please find the corroboration again from the Upanishad. Who can attain the Atman? How to see the Atman? Again and again the Upanishad says, Drishayate Tvagraya Buddha Sukshmaya Sukshma Darshidi It can only be attained by the Buddhi. Gita points it out again and again, Buddha, Vishuddhaya, Jukta, so on and so forth. And the beginning is here in the second chapter. So we must try to find out the true nature of this buddhi. So we must have a clear conception about the buddhi. It is not only nishchayatmika, it is the luminous knowledge, the living knowledge. Call it intuition if we like. And it is a faculty by which the knowledge of the self is attained. And again he reminds it is the source of all real knowledge. It is the source of all the real knowledge. How do you know that is real knowledge? The real knowledge gives the certainty giving buddhi. The Gita's term, please remember, Vyavasayatmika buddhi. Gita's definition of buddhi, instead of using the word nishchaya, it uses the word vyavasaya. Vyavasayatmika buddhi. Vyavasaya means nishchaya. Firm resolve. Grasping the thing in its essence. This is called vyavasaya. Vyavasayatmika buddhi in the verse 41 of the second chapter. So this certainty giving knowledge, which is one in all, that is another point to be remembered. Eka, Vyavasayatmika Buddhi Eka, in all it is the same, it is one in all. And it is contrasted with the wavering and uncertain thoughts of ordinary men. In the same verse you will find verse 41. The second line, Bahushakha Janantascha Buddhayo, 
Abhyavasainam. This plural buddhaya here stands for the wavering thoughts of the mind, not that certainty giving as I have just told you, that certainty giving buddhi, this vyavasaya. So how can I get that certainty? If we really analyze our own thoughts, we find sometimes this appears to be right. Next moment, I give it up. I take up something else. So I am not sure of my grounds. But there is a light in every heart. This is the teaching of the Bhagavad Gita. A pencil of ray, as it were, pierces the darkness that gives everyone the sense of absolute certainty. And we must hold on to it. And therefore he says that this buddhi is like the pole star, that fixed light. But how to get that fixed light? Buddha Sarana Manuch is a call to get hold of that fixed light that shines unwaveringly in every human heart. With this, the sadhana, the spiritual attainment is first achieved. To get hold of the true nature of the self, we must take the clue from the Buddha. So first we must be clear about the nature of the buddhi as Sri Krishna Prem has here given to us. The next question arises, but how to attain this union with the buddhi? We are trying to get hold of the steps as delineated by the Lord in the Bhagavad Gita. To attain this union with the buddhi, the method recommended is kill in action. Yoga karmasu kaushalam. We must take recourse to some skill. Skill in what? Skill in action. This is how the two things are joined. We must remember the teaching of the Bhagavad Gita is based on two things. One is known as buddhi yoga, sometimes called sankhya yoga, the same thing. And on the other hand is the karma yoga. So this karma yoga and buddhi yoga or sankhya yoga. So one leads to the other. This buddhi, this unwavering light, as it has been depicted here, how to get hold of it in the midst of this turmoil? This turmoil is known as karma. Karma is all the time taking us out. In the world, we are being tossed by the different currents, as it were, and thereby the light is lost. So it is an impossible task to get hold of that light while you are being tossed by the waves of action. But here, this is the unique teaching of the Bhagavad Gita. If you really know the skill, yoga karmasu kausalam. Now, what is that kaushal? We read over the Gita again and again, but we can't get hold of the real clue that is given. The clue is given here that the purpose of this karma yoga, which I am teaching to you, is to gain control of the desire-prompted impulses of the senses. First, the control of the desire-prompted action. This is the first thing. This is the first kaushala. And through that, to harmonize the mind, so that it can be made possible, it renders possible for the latter to unite with the Buddha. Because at the very outset we discussed, all problems are the problems of harmony. Because in the case of Arjuna and all of us, the problem arises because we are in disharmony. There is a conflict. But how to resolve that conflict? How to bring back that harmony? The Gita points out that you are being tossed about hither and thither because 
all your actions are prompted by the impulses of the senses. So the control must be first there, desire prompted action. That must be controlled. And then harmony of the mind. And third thing, what will happen if we can bring that harmony? The divine knowledge will blossom forth. The divine knowledge is a blossom forth. Please remember always that we have all this problem because our knowledge is covered. We can't see things clearly. As the Vedanta says, as the Gita says, our senses are confused or confounded. We must dispel that confusion. Remove that sense of confusion, as we find Arjuna also suffering from that. So that is term, please remember the Sanskrit term for this confusion is moha. So moha is something like a cloud that covers our knowledge. When the moha is removed, when the confusion is resolved, we get back the true illumination. So there are three steps. First, control of the desire prompted action, bringing back the harmony, blossoming forth of the divine knowledge. These are the three steps. So the first step should be taken, that is why it says, Yoga Karmasu Kaushalam. Now, when you are asked that you must control your actions, what do you generally do? Or how do you take it? We think that we must withdraw from the field of action. Let us cease from doing anything. But action cannot be controlled only by outer withdrawal. This is the most essential teaching given by the Bhagavad Gita. When you are asked to control, we generally try to stop the movement itself. But the movement is not at fault, and nor can we ever stop that movement. Please read the different verses in the Bhagavad Gita. I am not quoting all of them. Nahi kashchit shanam api jatu tishtat Nobody can stay without any movement or any action, because it will go on. Nahi kashchit shanam api jatu tishtat Karyate Javasha Karma Sarma Prakriti Jai Rigunai. Verse 5, Chapter 3. Again, if you want further proof, again he says a few verses ahead that the entire world is moving Evam Prabartitam Chakram. Verse 16. This chakra. This cycle is eternally moving. Again he warns in verse 8 of the third chapter, Sharira Jatra Pichate Na Prasidhed Akarmana. How do you live? Your very existence is dependent on this movement, on this action. So action cannot be stopped. In order to get out of this confusion, get out of this distress, we generally try to escape from the field that is here, the battlefield of Kurukshetra, this battlefield of life. But the Lord says that this mere outward withdrawal is not enough. It is an inner withdrawal that is to be practiced. This inner withdrawal he teaches so beautifully. Please consult these particular verses. How to control that inner control? That inner control must be brought. Verse 7 of the third chapter. Just to indriyani manasaniyam aravhate arjuna. Karmendriyai karma yogam. You must control through the mind. No outer control, stopping of the outer senses will be of any value or any purpose. 
manasanyamya. So, the inner control is necessary. That is to be practiced. So, not outer withdrawal, but inner withdrawal. What do you understand by this inner withdrawal? The inner withdrawal means withdrawal to higher levels, step by step. If you really want to get hold of the teaching of the Lord, He takes the seeker step by step to higher and higher levels. So this is the withdrawal, withdrawal to higher levels. That will bring that outer harmonization by itself. Don't try to bring the harmony outside by forcibly stopping all outward activity. But if we can really get hold of this higher level, withdraw into this higher level, from that higher level, the outer harmony also will be established. And this outer harmonization is essential if the buddhi is to be attained. We are trying to get hold of the buddhi. And for that, we have found that harmonization is essential. Without harmonization, we can't get hold of the buddhi. And again, for the harmonization, what is necessary? That inner control. That inner control means withdrawal to a higher level. That table is also given, as you know, at the end of the third chapter, Indriyani Paranyahu, Indriyabhya Parangamana, Manashastu Para Buddhir, Jo Buddhe Paratastu Sa. This is the ladder that is given here. Again in the Katho Upanishad, we have already done it. From the level of the senses, come to the level of the mind. And from the level of the mind, come to the level of the buddhi. And from the level of the buddhi, you get hold of the supreme thing, which we call the self. Jo buddhe paratastu sa. So from all these statements, it is clear that buddhi is the key. That is the pivot around which the entire teaching of the Bhagavad Gita revolves. That is why the Buddhi Yoga is the name we can give to the teaching of the Bhagavad Gita. And that is sounded at the very outset by that call, Buddha Saranam Anvicca. If we ask someone, why doesn't the Lord ask Arjuna to surrender everything to me, which he gives at the end? Mamekam Saranam Braja. But how can you know that Mam? How can you know that Ekam? Unless we first get hold of it in the Buddha, in the small beam of light that is in the heart. So this evolution of the teaching, this graded level of the teaching, and in order to get hold of that, we must have a very clear idea about this Buddha. You know that famous verse of the Bhagavad Gita. We are completely in the dark. Why you are in the dark? Sri Krishna Prem has given a very wonderful quotation from Plotinus. You know he is a great mystic of Greece. And this Plotinus he has very beautifully described this very same thing which the Gita describes here. We are all in dark and deep gloom. Ya nisha sarvabhutana. Tasyam jagarti sangjami. This is the sangjami. Sangjami means one who has got hold of this restraint. We have already said that one must first of all control the desire prompted impulses. He is the sangjami. But here he is awake. It is no longer the night. It has become the light. How the night has changed into light? Because of what? And Plotinus says, I am quoting, you will find it at the end, in the footnote there, at the end of the second chapter of Sri Krishna Prem's commentary. This fear of sense is of the soul in its slumber. 
the soul is absolutely dead almost in this fear of distance. The soul is in slumber. It is sleeping. For all of soul that is in body is asleep. We find no trace of the soul anywhere. Because as we know, the soul or the self is an eternal thing which does not change, which does not move, which does not become diffused. It is something like the steady pole star. But here we find everything in flux. Where is the trace of the self? We have done all these things because we have already discussed most of the Upanishads. Please remember in this connection, Atma Hano Jana. We are all killers of the self. We have all committed suicide as it were. Who are the Atma Hano Jana? Andhan Tamaha. We are all in the deepest gloom. Asurya Namate Loka Andhe Natamasabrata. Because we find no trace of the self. So he says, all of soul that is in body is asleep. Then what is the true getting up? Pratayans very beautifully says, the true getting up is not bodily, but from the body. I am now sitting, I get up. This is bodily getting up. The true getting up is not bodily, but from the body. What does it mean? We have already pointed out the teaching of the Gita starts with what? You must separate yourself from the body. Deha and Dehi. Dehi no sminyatha dehe kaumaram jovanam jara. So sometimes you look forward, sometimes you look back how this teaching of the Gita starts. And then he gives the steps. So we must be awake to the true self. And in order to be awake, we must distinguish between Deha and Dehi, with which the Lord starts his discourse in verse 13 of the second chapter. And now he is giving the process, step by step. If you want to separate the self from that which is the not-self, as Plotinus says, you must wake up or get up from the body. How can I get up from the body? Because the self is buried in the body. This is the resurrection. How can you get up from the body? This getting up from the body requires that kaushala. The first step that is taught is that kaushala. This kaushala means you must first Detach yourself from desire-prompted action, desire-prompted impulses of the senses, because the real bondage is not so much in action, but in the promptings of the desire. So Krishna Prem says that attain this union, the method recommended is skill in action. This is known as the Karma Yoga. So this Karma Yoga, in order to know this Karma Yoga, we enter into the third chapter, where again at the very outset you find, like most of us even now, we can't follow the teaching of the Bhagavad Gita. The disciple is in doubt, the disciple is confused, and he blurts out, he says that you are confusing me still more by your teaching. But Krishna Prem says that the Lord says that teaching is not confused. It is only the disciple that is confused. So the method of the true teacher, very beautifully points out, is not forcing the disciple to transcend the ordinary levels of thinking by having recourse to that higher level of buddhi or knowledge, thus bringing to birth in his soul a new and synthetic knowledge. 
This is a very important thing we must always remember. That knowledge cannot be grafted from outside. That knowledge lies embedded in every human heart. The task of the guru or the teacher is to awaken this uh, seeker to that level. This awakening, as we always say, in our mantras in which we adore the Guru. Jnananjana shalakaya chakshurun militam. He opens the eyes as it were. So he says, bringing to birth in his soul a new and synthetic knowledge. The Guru or here, the Gita is coming out of the lips of the great Guru, the Lord himself. So the Gita is neither a confused eclecticism nor a one-sided sectarianism. It does not teach one particular way and is also not trying to make an eclecticism that is jumbling up of different paths. But here he points out that there are two main types of aspirants. One is called modern psychological term extrovert, the other is introvert. So, the extroverts, they practice this karma yoga and the yoga of knowledge is practiced by the shankhya. Shankhya means the introvert and the yoga of action by the karma yogis. But immediately he warns the teacher, the Lord, that no one-sided view can be the whole truth. So this is a union, joining together of the two. Ekam Sankhyancha Yogancha This is another unique aspect of the teaching of the Bhagavad Gita. That is why Krishna Prem says it is not one-sided sectarianism. But how to join the two? First of all, as you've already pointed out from the verses, the secession from all action is simply impossible. These must be engraved in our heart. A secession from all action is simply impossible. Another thing he points out, the Lord points out, that mental actions quite unchecked and in fact more riotous because of the enforced outer inactivity. If we cease from outer action, what happens? Our mental actions become even more riotous. So the real purpose is to pacify the mind, bringing that harmonization. But that harmonization becomes impossible if we stop the outer action. Since action is a necessity, what should we do? We must come to grips with it and prevent it from exerting its fatal binding power on us. We feel chained by karma, chained by action. This is the binding power of karma. This binding power this fatal minding power, that must be prevented. So we are bound by what? Now we are going to the next step. This is very important. What is that which is binds us? We are bound by the results of our action and must experience the consequences, whether pleasant or painful. The Gita points out, that you are so much worried about your actions. It is the actions that do not bind you, but you are worried about the consequences, about the results. So the first thing you must detach yourself from is this bhoktitva. Bhokta means sukha and dukkha, it's enjoyment. You expect something from your action. This expectation this expectation means you 
want to have some result out of it. Don't become bhokta. And then ultimately you will be able to rid yourself even of the kartritva. First you must get rid of bhokta. Give up all the results. What is that result? I want to benefit by my action. This selfish motive, which you can call greed, this is the lobha that binds us. Karma does not bind us. It is the greed or desire for the benefit or result that will come out or accrue out of it that binds us. How unerringly the Gita points out where the real malady lies. The real malady lies that we are always expecting something out of our actions, whatever actions we pursue. Oh, you are going for a walk. Why are you going? I shall benefit. My health will be better by this. Why are you going to do this? I shall acquire some money or acquire some happiness. So, all our actions is chained or bound with the result or action. And if we don't get that desired result, immediately tension begins and we get lost. So, therefore, he says that we are bound by the results of our actions and must experience the consequences whether pleasant or pain. Action and reaction are equal and opposite. So I'm doing this and it comes back again to me. This is action and reaction. This is eternally going on. Any act sets up a tension in the whole. So this tension goes on. And it goes on increasing. And we can't get out of it. But what is the panacea for all this evil? What is the teaching of the Bhagavad Gita? The next concept we must take up. What does he teach? The first step, how to disentangle yourself from the result. Change your karma into jagya. This is the first thing. Every action must be done in the spirit of a sacrifice. Jagyarthat karmalo nyatra lokoyam karma bandhana. Karma is not a bandhana. But whatever action you pursue, not in the spirit of sacrifice. Jagyarthat karmalo nyatra lokoyam karma bandhana. Verse 9 of the third chapter. Here he gives the clue. And there also he gives the command. The next command. The tenth command. Tadartham karma kaunteya mukta sangha samachara. This is one most wonderful concept of this jagya that is given in the Bhagavad Gita. This is the first step to get hold of the buddhi yoga. We are in search of the buddhi yoga and what does this jagya bring to us? Concept of sacrifice. So long all our actions were being prompted by desire. There is not any fixed particular goal and not also any discipline behind it. Whenever we are being prompted by the senses, we used to rush out, pursue that line of action. But now, when you take up jagya, what happens? There are two things. One is called vidhi. You have to do this jagya with a particular discipline. According to the injunction. You can't do it as your free will. You are bound by a law. This is called vidhi. And the second thing is Vishnu. You are doing it for Vishnu. For a higher ideal. Vishnu means that which pervades everything. He is called Vishnu. Bebeshti. That is universal. Not any particular individual. Everything you do, 
you do as a sacrifice to that universal principle. How much you are contributing to that universal principle by your action. You find the reaction even the other day we were all very jubilant that they have signed this paper in America. Why? We are so jubilant. The two great leaders, because we find that in that, by that action, they have contributed to the benefit of all and not for any particular state or any particular individual. By their action, they have contributed to the welfare of human kind as a whole, mankind as a whole. That is why you applaud it. We feel so much relieved. And so long we are in tension because of that selfish spirit, one trying to annihilate the other. So this is ingrained in human nature to expand, to grow, to identify with everything. And the first step, according to the Bhagavad Gita, is to pursue the Jagya. Next we shall discuss how this principle of Jagya is inherent at the very root of creation. That is why I have referred to this particular incident that happened yesterday. If we contradict that principle, violate that principle, immediately a catastrophe comes and is looming large. We feel that we are going to be extinct. So he says that this Jagya Evam Pravartitam Chakram Prajapati, the Lord who created the entire universe, with this particular principle he created. But man, if he revolts and he does not follow that principle, thereby he brings his own doom, as well as the doom of all existence. And therefore we again find the relevance of the teaching of the Bhagavad Gita even up to the present day. In every problem of life, whether it is individual, whether it is universal, then we feel that they are following the line of the Gita, following the path of Jagya, following the path of universal sacrifice. So I would again request you to go to the very verses has come out of the lips of the Lord and find the different sequences and their application to our everyday life.